Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans 14. In verse 14, Paul said, Let us not therefore. Now, whenever you come to a therefore, you realize that it isn't the beginning of a uh, idea or a concept, but it is a as the result of and in conclusion or because of this. So whenever you come to a therefore, you have to ask wherefore. Why should we not judge one another? And Paul has been telling us about judging one another. He's been dealing with this bad practice that so often takes place within the body of Christ. Condemning someone else because they don't believe just exactly the way I believe. How do I handle it when someone believes a little differently from me? Do I condemn them and ostracize them from my company and say, well, you just don't belong to our crowd? Unfortunately, this is being done too much within the body of Christ. That kind of bigotry that insists that everybody see it exactly the way I see it. And a heretic is someone who believes differently than I. Because I, of course, know all the truth. And I possess all the truth. And it's always just the way I see it and understand it. No, God help us. Nobody has the corner on God's truth. And thus we are not to condemn someone else because he does believe a little differently. He sees things a little differently. He has different convictions than we have or he doesn't have the same convictions that we have. He has a liberty of doing things that we don't feel a liberty to do. But we are not to judge them. Let us not therefore judge one another. Because, as Paul has pointed out, we are all the servants of Jesus Christ. And He is the only one who has a right to judge the way I serve Him. And He will judge the way I serve Him. For one day I, along with you, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So let us therefore not judge one another because we are all the servants of Jesus Christ. We really aren't servants of each other. Before our own master we either stand or fall and one day we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of ourselves. Thank God I won't have to answer for you. <laughs> and you can be thankful you won't have to answer for me. Each of us responsible for our own actions and our own service of God. Now, let us be careful. Let us watch that we are not falling into the trap of judging another person, Paul is saying. But really, let us judge this or let us really watch out for this. This is something we really need to watch. That we do not put a stumbling block in our brother's path. Many a child of God has been stumbled in his Christian walk because of the poor or bad example that he has seen by others who are older in the Lord or by those who are in a place of Christian leadership. Taking on the obligation and responsibility of teaching the Word of God 
has to be one of the heaviest responsibilities that anybody can bear. James actually warns against it. He said, don't be quick to be a teacher knowing that they're going to receive the greater condemnation. Taking on the role of spiritual leadership does create a tremendous responsibility because people are looking at your life. And if they see you do things that they have personal convictions against doing, they can easily be stumbled by the liberty that you experience or feel in Jesus Christ. So be careful that you don't put a stumbling block in your brother's path. Of course, this immediately points up a problem that does exist, but we have to face the fact that it does. It's wrong. It shouldn't be. But so often we do get our eyes on human instruments instead of Jesus Christ. But there's always a danger of looking at a man or of making an idol of some minister or some leader or some instrument that God has used in a special way in your life. Because it seems that whenever you begin to place a person on a pedestal, that you'll begin to see the flaws that exist in each human being. So it is important that we not get our eyes upon man, our trust in man, but we keep our eyes upon Jesus and keep our trust in him. Now, if I am trying to draw people to admire me, and I am ministering in such a way as to curry their adulation, then I am putting myself in a very dangerous, precarious position because I'm very apt to stumble and fall and create a stumbling in them because they've been looking at me. And that is why I seek always to keep people from looking to me but I try to point them to Jesus Christ. Because if you watch me closely enough, you're going to see a lot of flaws. I told my wife, you know, one of the blessings of growing old, as you begin the aging processes and all, your eyesight also begins to fail. So you don't realize the wrinkles and the lines that are developing. You don't see them so clearly anymore. So you look in the mirror and it's not too bad, you know. <laughs> but my wife and I have a pact. And that is, we don't look at each other with our glasses on. <laughs> because if you look close enough, you're going to find a lot of flaws. So keep your eyes on Jesus. You're safe when you do that. When the prophet came to David after his sin with Bathsheba, one of the heaviest indictments that he made against David was that David through his action gave a cause for the enemies of God to blaspheme. And you know, I think that that is one of the saddest things when a leader falls 
is that it gives occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. They say, oh yes, you know, look at him. He was supposed to be this and that and the other. But look what he has done. And it gives a grounds for the Lord's name to be spoken ill of because of the failure of his servants. So let's be careful. We don't want to put a stumbling block in our brother's pathway. I may feel a complete liberty to engage in some particular practice. But some weak brother seeing me and observing my liberty in doing these things may be stumbled by it. <laughs> a few years ago, we were in Las Vegas for a radio rally. And we had to go through the casino to get to our room. And so my wife says, give me a penny, honey, because they have one of the penny one-armed bandits. And I thought, well, big spender, I can blow a penny, I guess, you know. <laughs> and I gave her a penny, and she put it in and pulled the thing and hit the jackpot. <laughs> Pennies went all over the place. And as she was gathering them up, who should walk in the door but Jimmy Kempner? <laughs> Kay, what's going on? <laughs> now, <laughs> I was glad it was Jimmy Kempner. Seeing my wife pick up pennies from a one-armed bandit could stumble some people, you know. We've got to be careful. We've got to be very circumspect in how we handle our liberty in Jesus Christ because we don't want to be guilty of stumbling somebody for whom Christ died. I've got to be concerned about the feelings and the convictions of others. Though I may not share them, I have to respect them. And I must seek not to flaunt my liberty in Christ before someone who does not share that same liberty. Now, Paul makes an extremely broad statement. He said, I am persuaded and I know that there is nothing unclean of itself. Verse 14, I know and am persuaded. Now that is probably one of the broadest statements of ethic that I've ever come across. Nothing in philosophy have I ever read that is that broad of an ethic. I know and am persuaded that there is nothing unclean of itself. And then Paul went on to say he knew that of Jesus Christ. This persuasion, this knowledge came from the Lord. You remember when the disciples of Jesus were challenged because they had eaten without going through the ceremonial washing of their hands. And Jesus stood up for the disciples against the Pharisees that were accusing them. And he said, don't you realize, fellows, that it's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles a man, but it's what comes out of his mouth that defiles him? For out of the mouth proceeds murders and blasphemes and adulteries and, and all. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. 
So you can know where a man's heart is by listening to what he says. And some men's minds are like racehorses. They run best in a dirt track. And you hear their conversations and all of these little innuendos and all of these little suggestions and the filth that comes out of a man's mouth is only a revelation of what's in his heart. Out of the abundance of a man's heart, his mouth speaks. So it is not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, however... Some men can put things into their mouth that will cause them to say things that they would not have said otherwise. Have you ever noticed a person who may be a very genteel type of a person until they get a few drinks under their belt and then they get very gross, very loud, and if you would take a tape recording of them in that inebriated condition and all of the things they were saying and, and the way they were carrying on, if you could take a video of them and then show them the next day, they would be embarrassed silly. You say, well, if a little booze will cause that kind of stuff to come out of your mouth, that's only revealing what's in your heart anyhow, isn't it? And we just have certain inhibitions which keep us from being so crass. Perhaps so, but let me just say that I surely wouldn't want to take something into my mouth that could bring out such pollution if it indeed does dwell there. But it isn't what goes into the man's mouth. It's really, it's what's in your heart that matters. And God knows the man's heart. I believe when Jesus was saying, it's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but what comes out, that Jesus recognized that the defilement is already in a man's heart. If defilement is there, whatever you eat or drink doesn't have anything to do with the defilement that already exists within your heart. Now, because of the defilement of a man's heart, it often dictates what he puts into his mouth. But it isn't what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. It may be a revelation of what's in his heart. The fact that he wants to put certain things in his mouth. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Very broad statement indeed. What this means is that I have a total and complete liberty in Jesus Christ. As Paul said in his first epistle, all things are lawful for me. You know, people so often look at Christianity as a very restricting experience. When in reality, Christianity is one of the greatest liberating forces in all the world. I didn't know what real freedom was until I became a Christian. I didn't realize how bound I was. What a slave I was until I was set free by Jesus Christ. But note that our liberty is in Jesus Christ. I am really not free to follow after my flesh or the desires of my flesh. But my freedom is in Him. I am not free as a child of God to live after the flesh. I am free from living after the flesh. Before I was a child of God, I wasn't free from living after the flesh. I did by nature those things. 
which deserve the judgment of God. I am now free, totally free, to live in Christ after the Spirit. There are many people that have taken half of a truth and run with it and gotten into a lot of trouble, and it can be very dangerous indeed. I know that there is nothing unclean of itself. <laughs> you can run into all kinds of trouble taking just a portion of the truth. There is therefore now no condemnation to whom? To those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. You see, it was never intended by God that you should be freed to live a life after the flesh. It was intended by God that you should be freed from the power of the flesh that has held you in its control all your lifetime. Now Paul goes on to declare that though he has this liberty and he knows, he's persuaded that there is nothing unclean of itself, if a man esteems something to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Matter of conscience. If in your heart or if in your mind you feel that it is wrong to do a particular thing, then for you to do that would indeed be wrong. Now, I personally feel it would be wrong for me to drink any type of alcoholic beverage. I believe it would be wrong for me to drink wine. Thus, if I did drink wine, it would be sin for me because I feel that it is wrong for me. Now, that's not saying that drinking wine is a sin. It is for me because I esteem it to be wrong. So if a man esteems something to be unclean, to him it is unclean. It is very important that we do follow our conscience. And how many times have I wished that I followed my conscience? When my conscience said to me, you better not do that, Chuck. And I said, oh, it won't hurt. And I did that which was a violation of my own conscience. I believe of the voice of the Spirit speaking to me. Because when I did it, man, the mess I got into. And later, how I wished I had listened to that voice that had said, you better not do it. Paul puts a lot of emphasis upon our conscience. Not that what you're doing is necessarily wrong. You see, in those days, they had very strong feelings about eating meat that had been sacrificed to pagan idols. That was just really something they felt a child of God should never do. You should never eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Now, Paul in dealing with this issue said when you go to the butcher shop to buy your meat don't ask the butcher if that meat had been offered to an idol but just buy it go home and eat it for conscience sake 
For if he says, hey, uh, you know, this was offered to an idol, yes, but, you know, it's cheaper, you can buy it. And, and, you, and you went ahead and bought it, and while you were eating, you think, ooh, my, this is terrible, you know, this meat was offered to idol, and you begin to have a conscience giving you a bad time over it. For your conscience sake, he said, just don't ask any questions. Because the meat is meat. It doesn't make any difference, really. How they butchered it or where they butchered it. Meat is meat. When you go to your friend's house and he has fixed a prime rib dinner be for you and he sets the prime rib down in front of you, don't say, was this beef offered to an idol before you bought it? <laughs> but that's where the scripture comes, eat what is set before you, asking no questions. Now we've taken that scripture out of context a lot when our kids say, do I have to eat this? And we say, eat what's set before you. Don't ask any questions, you know. <laughs> and we take that particular scripture out of context. It's, it's really dealing when you're going to a friend's house and he sets some meat before you, just eat what's set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. A lot of issues in the area of our own conscience. But the thing is, What may trouble your conscience may not trouble my conscience. What troubles my conscience may not trouble your conscience. And so you may have a freedom to eat something that I wouldn't have a freedom to eat. You may like to eat snails. I just don't have a freedom to. But if we go out and you order escargot, I shouldn't sit there and say, yikes, how can you eat that stuff? <laughs> Doesn't that make you sick, you know? And, and, and I shouldn't go on and, 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 and start condemning you and say, oh, that's terrible to eat that kind of stuff. If you, if, you know, if you enjoy it, fine. And I ought to let you enjoy it without trying to lay some heavy trip on you. I'm not to be your conscience. However, I must take into consideration your conscience because I don't want to do something that would offend your conscience, causing you to stumble. And so we have to be careful. that we don't offend someone else, that we don't stumble them because of our liberty and the exercise of that freedom that we feel in Jesus Christ. For if I only think of myself, then I am wrong. If I only think, well, this doesn't bother me and it's tough if it bothers them. That's not walking in love. I should be concerned if it does bother them. I must take into consideration those weaker brothers and seek not to destroy them by the liberty that I may feel in Jesus Christ. So if I know that certain things are an offense to them, I should not do those things deliberately in front of them. so as to bring them into offense. Nor should I boast of doing them in their presence. Paul said, do you have liberty? Have it to yourself. Keep it quiet. Don't destroy those for whom Christ died through the exercise of your liberty we must walk in love so if your brother is grieved because you eat meat then you're not walking in love you're not walking charitably so don't destroy him with your meat for whom Christ died 
Let not your good be evil spoken of. In other words, it might be fine for you. You might figure that it's a good thing. But don't let it be evil spoken of by someone who doesn't share that same liberty. For in reality, the kingdom of God isn't meat or drink. That's not what the kingdom of God is really about. The, the, the laws, the rules, the regulations about meat or drink. But the real issues of the kingdom of God are righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those are the real issues. But how many times we find ourselves reducing the kingdom of God to the material things of meat and drink. As we are judging one another or as we are condemning one another. It's over the meat and over the drink, over the outward issues rather than dealing with the spiritual issues, righteousness, peace. And joy in the Holy Spirit. So live peaceably with all men as much as is possible. By respecting their feelings, though you may not agree with them. Giving them space to be weird if they want to be weird. <laughs> to be narrow if they want to be narrow. Let them have their space. Don't offend them, nor try to change them from their convictions or their feelings. Allow them those feelings, and if they are to be changed, leave the changing up to the Lord. Growing up in the background in which I grew up, the church in which I grew up. There were a lot of convictions that were placed upon me that really came not from the Holy Spirit but came from the ministers who were supposedly proclaiming the gospel and the truth of God. And in those days, in the churches that I attended, it was very common to hear entire sermons on what a Christian looked like, what a Christian dressed like, where a Christian would go and where a Christian would never go. And with a lot of emphasis being placed upon the coming of the Lord, you surely didn't want to be caught in a place where a child of God should not be when the Lord comes again, or you will for sure be left behind. And because I had this kind of a background, I never attended a movie until I was in high school and I snuck off one evening and went to a movie and I mean you talk about guilt and feelings of guilt bunch of kids from high school wanted to go to this movie they said come on Chuck let's go and I didn't want to tell them that I was weird I didn't go to movies And so we went to the movie. I was never so miserable in all of my life as I was sitting in that theater. I didn't enjoy that movie one little bit. I was certain the whole time that I was sitting there that the Lord had chosen this time surely to come for his church. 
and I was going to be left out just over this dumb picture. Fortunately, the Lord didn't come, and I survived the experience. But I was so miserable, I never wanted to go back to a movie again. That's the way I was brought up. Now, I think that a very strong case could be made against most movies today. I think that it is not good to pollute our minds with the filth from Hollywood. And yet, I personally have a whole different attitude than I once held. Because my convictions were really something that man had put upon me rather than God. And I believe that there are some movies that can be very entertaining, some that can be very educational, and some that can be totally degrading and defiling. So I think that if a person has that liberty and feels the liberty to go to the theater, they need to use good judgment in what they go to see or to hear. Because once you open the door and allow that stuff to come in your mind, it's awfully hard to get it out. And so it's much easier just to keep the door closed and not let it in than to later try and purge your mind of the filth that you have seen. Now I know a lot of people that feel the complete liberty of going to the theater. I don't. Oh, I saw Chariots of Fire when we were in Hawaii. And I thought it was an excellent movie. But that's one in how many. I understand The Prodigal is an excellent movie. I may see it someday when they release it for churches. <laughs> and we have it on Friday night. But... Each one of us have our own feelings of what is right for me to do and what is wrong for me to do. Our feelings differ. I am not to press my feelings upon you, but I am to respect the feelings that you have. And walking in love, not exercise my liberty in Christ in a way that would offend you or stumble you. That's what Paul's talking about here tonight. Walking in love one towards another. Considerate of another person's feelings. Respecting another person's feelings. Seeking not to stumble them. Because though we may think they're totally outrageous, God loves them. Jesus died for them. Let's not drive them away. Because in our selfish, calloused attitude, we think, I'll do what I please, and it doesn't matter what others think. It really does. And if you're a child of God, you're going to be concerned about that. Shall we pray? Father, help us to walk in love one towards another. Give us, Lord, liberty in the way in which we look at each other. And the feelings that others may have. 
that I might accept my brother for whom Christ died, even though he may be doing things that would for me to be would be wrong to do. God, take away the attitude of judgment from my heart that I might love as you loved, that I might forgive even as you have forgiven me. In Jesus' name, amen.